Welcome to Invested in Climate. Protecting the planet and decarbonizing the global economy is the challenge of our time. Never before have so many people rallied around a common cause. We all have a role to play, and the opportunity we face is unprecedented. Invested in Climate aims to help people do more to address climate change through their work, investments, learning, lifestyle, and activism. I'm your host, Jason Rissman. I co-lead a climate venturing practice at the design firm Ideal, supporting early stage climate founders and organizations. I'm also an investor and startup advisor, and have realized that when it comes to climate action, I'll be a lifelong learner looking for the best ways to have a climate positive impact. If you like what you hear, give us a good rating on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you found us. Follow us on social, subscribe, and spread the word. Find episodes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. Thanks for joining. You have so many great organizations and enlightened policymakers and enlightened business folks who are trying to do this. I just think we haven't reached that mass where we can have that tipping point where we're like, oh, why weren't we doing this 50 years ago? Hi, everyone. In last week's episode, we talked about soil and regenerative agriculture. This week, we continue the theme, but with a broader lens and talk holistically about food. I think it's really important for anyone who cares about climate change to understand the food system. Food is both really accessible, it's something we touch every day, and a system of interwoven industries, processes, and relationships that are really complex. It's also responsible for about a third of greenhouse gas emissions. So I love talking about food, not just because it makes me hungry and I like to eat, but because it unravels some of that complexity and helps us understand what needs to change. My guest today is a food expert, advocate, and movement builder who's been working to improve the global food system for a long time. Danielle Nirenberg is the president of Food Tank, a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that is helping food get more attention and helping catalyze action at every level, from grassroots to business to policymakers. We talk about Danny's experience and then explore opportunities for climate ranging from regenerative ag and fertilizers to food waste and the future of meat. We also talk about recent policy wins and priorities for 2023. This conversation was a lot of fun and I think you'll enjoy. Let's get started. Danny, welcome to Invested in Climate. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, so pleased to be here, Jason. Thank you so much. I saw that you're based in New Orleans. Is that where you're dialing in from? I'm not based in New Orleans anymore. I lived there for a while. I now live in Baltimore, Maryland with my husband and a cat and a dog. Oh, fantastic. I was going to say that New Orleans is a great place to be focused on food, but hey, Baltimore has amazing food as well. I've had some great meals there. I'm sure it keeps you well fed, though I'm sure you're also on the road all the time. So much that I want to talk about today. I'm really excited to pick your brain and learn more about the role of food system in climate change. But first, let's learn about you. You are the founder and president of an organization called Food Tank, a nonprofit think tank focused on improving the global food system. Tell us, how did you become so passionate about food and what led you to create your organization? Yeah, and I actually co-founded it with Bernard Pollack, who is an amazing strategist and is really one of my very best friends in the world. So Food Tank was started with this very simple idea of highlighting what works in food and agriculture systems, both domestically and internationally, in order to inspire and activate farmers and businesses and policymakers and all of us as eaters and other stakeholders to transform our food systems for the better. And the idea what came out of Bernard and I were working at an environmental think tank many years ago in Washington, D.C., where if you'd asked me when I was 16 where I wanted to work, I would have said this institution, the World Watch Institute, And it was great to to grow up there. It was where I went directly after grad school. But we, and I did a lot of on the ground reporting. I did a lot of on the ground research into things like gender and population and the growth of factory farming around the globe and really being able to experience things firsthand. And then Bernard and I ran this project called Nourishing the Planet, where we traveled to half of the continent of Africa, 26 countries in total, interviewing hundreds of farmers and other stakeholders. And really at that time, learning 
that there's so much hope and resilience across the continent and countries are very different. People often talk about Africa like it's one place. It's very complex and very different, just like the United States is. And there's and so much going on there that we saw if it had a little bit more attention, a little bit more research or investment behind it, it could be scaled up and out in so many different ways. And we wanted to change the paradigm of storytelling to talk about those things that are on the ground working. Environmental organizations are often known for doom and gloom. We wanted to inspire and present some hope to folks. Amazing. And it's incredible that even at the age of 16, you had such clarity of where you wanted to work. Where did that come from? How did you know originally that you were so interested in this topic? I don't know. I'm a big nerd. I grew up, my parents were city folks who moved to the country because they wanted to make sure their kids had fresh air. They were from Chicago. I grew up in Defiance, Missouri, and I grew up around farmers and really wanted nothing to do <laughs> do with them. But I, I was a like sort of a rabid environmentalist as a kid and was like a member of the World Wildlife Fund, WWF. And, like I was 10 years old. I like wrote letters for Greenpeace. <laughs> I think it just came out of this understanding of wanting to protect the environment in whatever way I could. And I tell this story a lot, but like, I blamed farmers for destroying the rainforest and being what I thought at that time were bad actors. But I, right after undergrad, I went to be a Peace Corps volunteer and had this incredible opportunity to work with so many farmers and extension workers and teachers and really had this kind of slow epiphany that I was really missing out on blaming farmers. They were actually doing all the things that I wanted in the world, protecting soils, protecting biodiversity, doing all these incredible things. And so it was just like, ah, uh, a lot of Peace Corps volunteers, I feel, have this. You go in thinking you know everything and you want to save the world. And you're like, oh, these people are saving me. <laughs> I'm the one who needed help here. Where did you volunteer? In the Dominican Republic. Amazing. And we'll get to the focus and mission of Food Tank. But despite the good efforts of the farmers, was it also enlightening in terms of how they were immersed in a system that was problematic? Yeah, you see this all over the world. I think farmers are, especially smallholders, are to grow export crops rather than crops that can actually nourish themselves and their communities. And I think you're, you're seeing this sort of takeover of agriculture by big entities instead of localization and localization. Yeah, I spent some time in Central America, and that was definitely the case there as well with corn and a lot of the fish being exported and people locally really having trouble being able to afford the local crops. Absolutely. And we don't talk about aquatic systems and blue foods enough and the impact that they have on not just coastal communities. Our rivers and ponds and streams provide so much protein for folks around the world. And for some people, it's their only source of both food and income. So remembering those aquatic systems, those blue foods, as they're often called, I think is really important. Thanks for that background. Danny, Food Tank is now celebrating, I believe, its 10th anniversary. Congratulations on that milestone. And I'd love to hear a bit about the role that Food Tank is playing today. Thanks so much. It's hard to believe that we started 10 years ago. And to see how we've grown, we're still a small, scrappy organization. We punch above our weight, I think, in some respects. But I'm really proud of some of what we've been able to do in terms of we we were recently in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt at the COP27, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, and being able to, for the first time, really understand that food, I've been to many of these conversations, these COPs, and food and agriculture have not always been a big part of the conversation. This time, there was a whole day devoted to food. There were four food pavilions and Food Tank was able to partner across all four of those pavilions to help curate panels with indigenous folks, with farmers, with people who are fighting food loss and food waste. A lot of different stakeholders who are doing incredible things to make sure that food is the solution. Food and agriculture systems are the solution to the climate crisis. It's amazing that you're working at that high policy level. I also think of Food Tank really as being a movement and an avenue for people to get involved. What are some ways that people can get involved in Food Tank? There are lots of ways. We are mostly funded by individual members and then small family foundations. We want people to feel like the platform of Food Tank is their own to use and to learn from. We really get a lot of, of our article ideas from members or people who write us or contact us on social media. When the war against Ukraine started, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, one of our members was located in Ukraine and he is an agricultural economist and he began writing stories stories from 
basically the battlefield for us about how this was affecting how the war and Russia's illegal invasion was affecting farmers and food production on the ground. And thankfully, I have to knock on wood, he's still safe and he wrote for us recently. But I think that's a great example of how Food Tank can utilize our platform to help get these stories that are actually happening in real time out to our audience. Great. And I saw that there's working groups and membership options, and of course, a lot of content and research. So really a resource for people on all sides of thinking about food to help them be more educated and more involved. Absolutely. And we try to think of ourselves as in the center, neither left nor right. My my co-founder Bernard and I often say that if, if the right is mad at us and the left is mad at us, we're doing the right thing. And if they're both pleased with us, we feel like we're doing the right thing too, squarely in the middle. There's many reasons why one might want to work on and improve the food system to better nourish people around the world, to cut obesity, diabetes, and other food-caused health problems, to create more and better jobs, to address animal cruelty. The list goes on and on. But we're here today to talk about climate change. We'll start at a high level and have plenty of time to drill down into specifics. And maybe it's first best to start by unpacking some of the jargon that we've already started to use. Food system is a term that's used in the sector, but not necessarily familiar to most people. So I'd ask, what actually is the food system? It's a term that that people have been using more recently. I think we thought about food and agriculture, but it, it just really, I think food systems is defined by the idea that everything's connected, right? That it's not siloed, that nutrition and food and the care of animals and workers and communities are all interlinked and that each one influences the other. If we look at them in silos, if we look at them separately, I think it, it does us a disservice. It's been doing us a disservice for the last 70 years. So making sure that the term systems really helps people see the links between all of these things. And if we can solve for food, if we can solve for a lot of the other crises we're facing, whether it's the biodiversity loss crises, our public health crises, and of course, the climate crisis. Let's turn to that. And we'll start at a really broad level. And this is an enormously broad question. But let's start there and see how we can drill down. So I'd ask, how is the food system, as it's currently designed, exacerbating climate change? Food and agriculture systems contribute about 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions. And that's why when I say we, if we can solve for food, we can solve for so many different things. Because if we tweak some of the way we're producing and consuming food, we can reduce those greenhouse gas emissions. For example, if you look at food loss and food waste, if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions but behind China and the United States. So if we can figure out better ways to, to prevent and protect post-harvest food, that would be great. If we can prevent food waste at the consumer and retail and restaurant and hospitality level, that would be great. These are often things that seem pretty easy for talking about post-harvest losses, using different kinds of storage techniques that don't cost farmers a lot of money or no money at all. Things like cutting the tops off sweet potatoes can prevent sweet potatoes from going bad. If you're talking about consumers, it's doing using your freezer more, utilizing leftovers. It's at the restaurant and retail level, it's being able to measure your food waste from week to week so that you can make better purchasing decisions. So these are all things that like, they're not rocket science, right? They don't take any sort of big techno fix to, to solve, but they can make a really huge impact on solving the climate crisis. No, I love that you jumped into talking about food waste. It's a topic that I'm definitely really passionate about too, and love talking about partially because it's so accessible and something that we touch all and that we all can have an impact on. But let's take a, a broader solutions lens and talk about the opportunities and priorities for reversing climate change through food. And so I'd ask, what are the most important levers for climate progress that you see and how would you prioritize them? I think a lot of things need to happen all at once. We need more sustainable agriculture systems. That The term regenerative is often used, but what regenerative agriculture is essentially agroecological solutions. And ecology is both a movement and a practice. It really looks at those linkages, right? It looks at foods as a system, as we discussed before. 
And I think if farmers and large and small are able to incorporate more agroecological practices, whether it's things as simple as cover crops that very large farmers can do and make money off of by selling as animal feed or selling to emerging brands for ingredients. Smaller farmers are already using a lot of these regenerative practices or these sustainable practices because they don't have a choice, right? Fertilizer, artificial fertilizer is often very expensive, especially for smallholder farmers across the world. From those indigenous food ways that people have been practicing for centuries, but also helping those smallholder and medium scale farmer invest in, in those practical solutions. I think what has happened since the dawn of the Green Revolution that happened after World War II, where their farmers were encouraged to use agrochemicals because there was a fear that in Mexico and Latin America and also India, that there was going to be mass starvation. Those were short-term fixes, hybrid seeds and the massive use of artificial fertilizer. I think if we had looked at them as using medicine when one is sick, instead of using them over the long term, they would ultimately have been more effective because now we're seeing the fallout from the Green Revolution with farmers stuck in a vicious cycle of poverty, farmer suicides happening all over the world, not just in India, where we've heard a lot, but also in the United States, where industrial agriculture has sort of made farmer serfs on their own land. So I think it's really looking at how we can change the system because if farmers are able to have control over what they're growing and how they're growing it, a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions that come from agriculture would naturally be sort of reduced. We'd have more regional and localized food systems that would cut down on transportation costs, they would cut down on the use of those inputs. So there's just a lot, I have to think about it in a very broad way because a lot of these things just need to happen and happen very urgently over the next five or six years because we have a very sort of urgent moment in time to reverse the sort of <laughs> the Titanic that we're on. We can turn it around, but we have to do it quickly. Yeah, so much there. And you brought up regenerative ag, also synthetic fertilizers, two topics I'd love to go deeper into. Also, the notion of the urgency and just how big of a system it is and how hard it is to move something so big so quickly. Let's go deeper into regenerative ag. Actually, last week's episode focused on soil health and a company called Biodel Ag that's working on a new product called Sequester that's both improving soil health and also improving soil's ability to capture carbon and was really exciting for me to learn about some of the momentum that they're seeing. But I'm curious for you, what are some of the momentum and trends that you see in the Regen Ag movement? Because it is an exciting idea, but also something that's still relatively small in terms of its distribution around the world. I don't know how small it is. If you look at, you know, at least 70% of the world's food is produced by smallholder farmers across the world. And most of them are not using industrial practices. Most of them are using what we would all, all of us as white folks would call regenerative agriculture now when it's actually indigenous practices that have been used for, yeah. And I think it's really interesting to think about regenerative agriculture because it's simple. It's this idea of farming in concert with nature. Instead of ex being an extractive tree, agriculture can actually be one that puts things back, that looks at the interconnections between how we farm and produce food and the entire sort of ecosystem. And I, I think that's a trend that I don't know how anyone can dispute that. I know there are lots of big agricultural companies who are now using the term they, they co-opted sustainable agriculture several years ago. Now they're using the term regenerative ag. But I, I do think that this is a system of producing food that most people can get behind, except their shareholders <laughs> force them not to. And I, I think that's, we have to think about corporate consolidation in our food and agriculture systems. And especially around meat, dairy, and egg production, there are very few firms like the JVSs and Cargills of the world that control how our meat is produced. And the same is pretty much true for dairy and eggs. And that corporate consolidation leads to industrialized food production that, again, farmers are caught in that vicious cycle. If we could break down that, that consolidation and return to more regenerative practices, we'd still be able to feed everybody. We produce more than enough food to feed 10 billion people in the world right now. What we lack is political will to make sure that food gets to people who need it the most. We don't prevent food waste, as we talked about before. If we could do those things, we produce more than enough food, and then we could shift to these more regenerative, sustainable, agroecological practices and have a way to restore soils, help reverse climate change, et cetera. 
Danny, you brought up a really interesting tension, which is the need for large food companies and big ag to get into more regenerative practices, but also the potential that they latch onto terms, co-op them, and maybe water them down. And so I'm curious, like, where is their systems of rigor and how do you think about that balance between bringing in the biggest players while not overwhelming or hurting the small scale farmers and also sticking to the highest principles, the best practices that we actually really need for the future? Yeah, Jason, I don't have a good answer. It's something I think about and worry about all the time because I have come to the conclusion, and this took me a long time in my career to understand that if we're not talking to corporations, if we're not talking to big food and ag, if we ignore them and just shun them and villainize them, that we won't get where we need to go. They do need to be part of the solution. But it's difficult for me as someone who considers themselves, despite what I said before about food tank being in the middle, that's very intentional. My personal viewpoints are very different often than that. And so I want corporations to change and I have to take off my activist or advocate hat and think about this very deliberately. Like, how do we talk to and listen to corporations in a way that will move the needle? How can we convince them that our current food system as it stands is built on the cost of food production is felt not by the companies themselves. And I'm talking about the externalities like pollution and healthcare costs, and again, worker and animal abuse and loss of biodiversity. We as consumers or the environment pay the cost of those externalities. Companies should be paying the cost of those externalities. And if they did, they would produce food in a very different way. If they were forced to pay for the pollution, if they were forced to pay for diabetes and heart disease that ultra processed food causes, they would produce food differently. They would produce food that was actually nutrient dense, delicious and accessible and affordable to everyone. Thanks. I hear that tension and I don't have the easy answer either. But I have another tangible example and a question related to it, which is as we think about the need for large industrial food companies to change practices, but also remain viable and continue to produce at the scale or at a greater scale than they've been producing as population grows. The question of synthetic fertilizers, of course, comes up. And fertilizers, to be fair, have really helped modern farming increase yields and feed billions of people. Yet, they're incredibly carbon intensive to manufacture and use. So how do we break our dependency on synthetic fertilizers? Or is it that there's possible alternatives that do not require fossil fuels as much and are cleaner to produce? It's both, right? Stop the subsidies that go towards artificial fertilizers in places like Malawi and instead incentivize farmers through subsidies to use more sustainable agriculture practices that actually restore soils. Or as I said before, use artificial fertilizers judiciously. Oftentimes farmers are encouraged to to use more than they need, or they don't have the extension services in place that would help them decide how much their crops need that year. We really need to work towards using animal manure and compost and organic materials as the way to bring hope to our soils again. Soils are massively depleted all over the globe. If we could use more natural processes that don't have that carbon intensification that you mentioned, then we'd, we'd be doing ourselves and future generations a great service. Aside from people talking about this more, are you seeing any signs of progress, Any anything that's really giving you hope in terms of new opportunities and a shift? If you look back to the early 2000s, fertilizer subsidies in Malawi that I mentioned before were, were touted as though this was going to save sort of Malawi itself and the continent. And what you're seeing now is that yields have gone, they're going down because farmers have overused fertilizers because of subsidies. And you're seeing the government rethink that kind of trajectory and other governments doing the same thing. I wish the U.S. would think more about how we subsidize industrial agriculture. So I do think there's hope. And I do think that there's this massive movement of farmers who are realizing that the industrial system doesn't work for them and that they'd like to do things differently. But they, again, they need to be incentivized to shift practices because farmers like all of us, we forget that they're they're not just food producers, they're business people. They need to make money and they need to know that they'll be making money this time next year, that they have enough money to buy seeds, et cetera, no matter how big or small they are. One of the topics you brought up before that I want to circle back to is food waste. And I mentioned that's an area that I'm excited about. It's an area where I've gotten to do some work. And I love talking about it because it's so accessible and something that all of us can have an impact on. And one of my earlier episodes was with Dana Gunders, the executive director of Reef. And I think it's something that we need to keep talking about because of that potential impact. It seems like an obvious solution. 
And yet it's actually a really hard problem. And we're nowhere near, oh, say, ReFed's goal of cutting food waste by 50%. So I'm curious, are you seeing any signs of progress in this space? And do you see any systemic barriers that could be removed that would actually really accelerate progress faster in reducing food waste? Yeah. And just a huge shout out to Dana Gunders and all the incredible work over the last almost decade and a half that she's done to raise awareness about food loss and food waste. This is something people didn't think about in 2010. And now it's in magazines, on the news. There are TikToks about reducing food waste. So thank you to Dana and all of the work that she's done. And I do see hope. The Food Donation Improvement Act was signed into law a few days ago by President Biden. It helps make it easier for individuals and organizations to donate perfectly good food that would otherwise be wasted to people in need. And that's what happens a lot is that there's a fear of liability. So food from retailers or hospitality goes to waste. It goes in the trash bin because the food banks or religious institutions or schools can't take it because the companies or the retailers fear liability. Now that's been not exactly eliminated with this bill, but eventually there will be oversight through USDA that will help make that donation process much easier. This is a huge sort of bill that was passed just before the new Congress was sworn in. And I think it's really exciting because it shows it was developed by the Healthy Living Coalition, which is led by WW International. Most of us know it as Weight Watchers. And they heard from a member of theirs that he was seeing so much food waste and he wanted to do something about it. WW, with its massive sort of infrastructure and funding, could put together the Healthy Living Coalition, which is made up of nonprofit members, as well as corporates and other institutions, to galvanize behind this bill, encourage lobbying by individual citizens and others to really get behind it. And Jim McGovern, Congressperson Jim McGovern, is somebody I can sue consider a food superhero. And he really brought this bill to fruition and made sure that it could really help people most in need. Something that's needed now much more than ever with the, we're still in a pandemic. Lots of people are still trying to recover from being out of work. We still have massive need at food banks and other places. This could really help sort of shift the needle on, on hunger in the United States. And it's exciting to me because it shows the power of our democracy. And it shows the power that the food movement can have if we come together. And I think that's a really exciting thing that I see. It gives me hope, especially in this sort of complex, very uncivil environment of politics that we're seeing. Thanks for that, Danny. And it's exciting that there is opportunity to collaborate around food. I think that bringing people together around food experiences can absolutely be transformative. And it should absolutely on the political front be something that we can agree on. One thing we haven't talked about, and actually that's been politicized, is meat. And I guess it's the elephant in the room, or for climate, it's really the cow in the room. My kids would not forgive me for that sort of a dad joke. But (laughs) let's talk about meat and the potential for really having a climate impact by reducing the consumption of meat, particularly beef. So I'm curious how you're seeing this issue. Do you believe that we'll be able to reduce overall meat consumption in the next few decades? Do you think we'll switch to lab-grown cultivated meat? Or will this be an area where the food system and people's preferences really remain at odds with the environment? Such a good question. I was just moderating a panel last night in Brooklyn about Chloe Sorvino, a journalist from Forbes. She leads their food and agriculture reporting called Raw Deal. And it talks about consolidation in the meat industry and the impact that it has had on the environment, on community health, on worker health, as we saw so profoundly during the pandemic. And it really looks at how we can change this. And it's not just reducing meat consumption. It's refining the types of meat you eat. It's certainly eating less of it. It's thinking of meat more as a condiment and rather than something as a, at the center of your plate. It's thinking about protein differently. I think most people understand that you can get the, all the protein you need without eating meat. That was something that most people didn't know maybe 20 or 30 years ago. It's looking at plant forward options, not necessarily telling everyone to become vegan. That's not realistic, but it's looking at meat just differently than we have over the last however many decades. Whether that 
that's feasible, especially in emerging economies where, you know, as people get more disposable income, they spend it on different things. And one of those is often meat. I think we need huge sort of education and awareness campaigns, not just in the United States, but all over the world about how the effects of industrial meat production, the differences between grass fed, really well done, holistically raised and grass fed livestock compared to our industrial food systems. And I'm looking at not just the climate sort of benefits or, or potential benefits of that, but also the nutritional benefits, the benefits to farmers and workers and others. And I think when we're talking about the climate crisis, we can't forget again that it's linked to so much else. It's not just about reducing carbon. It's about what you're going to gain. I think when people think about, oh gosh, now I have to reduce my meat consumption, they just think of the loss that they're facing. And they don't think of what they're gaining in terms of trying different kinds of cuisine, eating more plant-based options, trying some of those alternative meat sources. And just on that front, the alternative meat source sector is, is very Indian and complex right now. The sort of vegetarian burgers of the 1990s have given way to these very ultra processed options from companies like Impossible and Beyond Meat. And I'm not sure if those are the greatest sources of protein because it's just replacing one bad food with another. And we don't really understand the climate implications and if we're actually reducing greenhouse gas emissions by eating those particular kinds of processed foods. And I think we would just do better if we all had more vegetables and whole grains and other delicious foods in in our diets and ate less meat overall. But again, as you said, it is very political. Meat, especially all food is very personal to people, but meat especially is personal to people. They look to the things that their grandmothers or grandfathers cooked. There's history embedded in it. It does signify culture. And if you have made it, if you've made enough money that you can have meat on the table. These are all the sorts of things that are very personal to people and telling them that they can't eat meat is not going to save the world. It's also potentially an enormous business opportunity. We've seen that the alternative protein sector has been has received a ton of investment capital. And then there's a bunch of concern that, okay, maybe sales aren't picking up or continuing to increase as they have. I'm curious, what is your feeling about alternative protein for investors? Here's how I feel about investment in food by these and others. I think they look at food as a commodity and not as a human right. Food is very different than the other things that they've been investing in their whole careers. And I don't think they get it. And I wish they did. So while it, it's exciting to see investment in food overall go up, at least over the last few years, we'll see where this goes now. I wish we were actually that investment was used for problems that actually needed to be solved, that they, those VCs were talking to farmers and eaters and nutritionists and others and really solving for the problems that actually need to be solved in our food system. We need more nutrient-dense foods. We need less ultra-processed foods. We need foods that make farmers more money but are also accessible and affordable to consumers. If they could put their billions towards solving those kinds of problems, I think we'd make more headway. I haven't talked about cellular meat. Upside was in the first stages of approval by FDA to be sold in the United States. Cultivated cellular meat is being sold in places like Singapore. It's already happening. Maybe those will provide the mouthfeel that people crave. But again, I don't think they're the solution overall. I think they're, they might be a part of the, the tools in the toolbox, but they're not going to solve what we're facing right now. We need better agricultural systems that, again, benefit people and planet. And I don't mean to be trite. I just mean to say that like we need food systems that are focused on building soils and building communities and improving equity and diversity and eliminating the violence that has been inherent in our food systems. Let's talk about that systems level impact. How do you do it? Is it about chipping away at each of those individual and probably hundreds or thousands of of different elements of the food system that need to be improved? Is it just about changing consciousness and getting people to think completely differently? Is it about policy? Like, What are the biggest levers that you see for that sort of systemic change? Jason, all those things need to happen at once, right? You need policy, you need awareness, you need companies learning more about how to do these things better. You need farmers to get on board. You need more collective organizing among farm workers and restaurant workers and the folks who deliver our food to us. You need all of these things to be happening at the same time. And that's, I think that's what will really change. And you have change how we're eating and producing food. 
you have so many great organizations and enlightened policymakers and enlightened business folks who are trying to do this. I just think we haven't reached that mass where there, we can have that tipping point where we're like, oh, why weren't we doing this 50 years ago? You mentioned that at COP27, there was a carve out a full day focus on food for the first time. And yet on your website, I read an article that was criticizing COP for really focusing too much and supporting big agriculture too much, perhaps at the expense of small scale farmers. So I'm curious, what were your lasting impressions from the UN Climate Change Conference last year? And what are next steps that you see for the global policy arena? Yeah, it's so interesting. Like when you're at COP, you're excited that all these conversations around food and agriculture are happening. And then you're very disappointed that the negotiators didn't include all of that great sort of (laughs) input into the final documents. I think we made headway at COP27, just as we did it. And by we, the global sort of social movement around solving the climate crisis. But at COP26 in, in Glasgow, a lot of progress was made on getting food panels in different pavilions. This time, again, we had four food pavilions dedicated to food and agriculture. Some of them were funded by companies that like I don't necessarily agree with, but I I think having those conversations was important. What Food Tank has tried to do, and we tried to do this at COP, was have these uncomfortable conversations with business, with indigenous folks, with the people who are doing cellular agriculture, with the folks who are trying to prevent food loss and food waste, because they need to happen. And whoever's funding the pavilions, at the end of the day, I don't know how much it matters, right? What matters is that we get these conversations going and that we try to make some progress. I feel hopeful because I have to be. If I didn't feel hopeful, I couldn't do this work. And I feel hopeful for lots of reasons. One, because young people, I saw them stand up at COP and say they weren't like literally not going to take what previous generations have thrown at them. They want to change how we produce food and how we eat food. And I don't think that they are going to allow big corporations and others, and especially policymakers, to continue business as usual. They, Gen Z and whoever comes behind them, they're going to have a lot of power and they can put companies out of business and they can take policymakers out of office through their actions. And from what I've seen over the last couple of years, I would take notice if I was a big corporation or a policymaker who didn't care much about these issues. Danny, we've talked about so many different food topics. I'm grateful for this broad overview that we ventured on. We're at the start of a year here, still in January. I'm curious, what do you see as your top two or three priorities, most important things that you're going to work on and and try to affect this year? I'm really excited about a couple of different things. One is we're planning a lot of programming on Capitol Hill to educate policymakers and their staffers. The first event will be in collaboration with the Sweetie Center for Sustainable Agriculture at Arizona State University. Kathleen Merrigan is the director there. And you might remember during the Obama administration, she was deputy secretary of agriculture under Vilsack, who is again now the current agriculture secretary. And she made a lot of progress on local foods and things at that point. She's just, she's an incredible human being. And what we'll be working on with her is around the issue of hunger and higher education and how university and college students are really suffering because they're trying to get an education. We tell everyone they they need to go to college. But in in addition to buying books and paying for room and board, many college students are going hungry. And this was especially prevalent during the pandemic. And so we need more SNAP benefits to be available to college students. We need more food pantries on college campuses that put dignity first so that it's very easy for students to, to shop because they are clients of food pantries, you know, to de-stigmatize how food is looked at. So I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about the lead up to Climate Week in September in New York, because that sort of sets the tone for the next COP that will happen in Dubai in New- in November. We're really hoping that will actually be the food COP, the food and agriculture COP, where food and agriculture will really be seen as this huge lever to turn the climate crisis around. Danny, thank you for that. Hey, you are a podcast host as well. Tell us about it and what should folks listen for in, in some upcoming episodes. Thank you so much. People can find Food Talk with Danny Nuremberg wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also subscribe on our website. We just did this great interview with Michael Fakri, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. And we talked about some of the things you and I talked about, include food sovereignty and corporate consolidation in our food systems and the need for more equity and how I talk a lot about urgency. And Michael Fakri told me to slow down. He's good. You have to be careful because when we advocate for urgency, 
urgency that also often allows those with the most power to act the most quickly. It's a good reminder that even though I feel this urgency and want things to change very rapidly, that sometimes we need to slow down. But Michael Fockery is a hero. He's like a treasure and a national treasure. And I was really excited to have the opportunity to speak to him. Danny, thank you so much for being here today. Best of luck with all the important work that you're doing. And it was great to catch up. Thanks, Jason. Good luck to you too. A real fan. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Invested in Climate. Please remember to rate us on Apple, Spotify, or Google. Find show notes, sign up for updates, get in touch, and visualize your climate action at investedinclimate.com. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and does not constitute financial, accounting, or legal advice. Thanks again.